going to share my screen and we'll take it from there. Ah, where is the code? Okay, so you guys can see my screen now, right? And um, let me open my terminal as well. Okay, so this is the code we used yesterday. Let me close this one. Can you guys see my screen? Now we see you. Wow. What type of sharing did I do? Okay, let me try to share again. Share screen. Desktop. Share. Now you can see, right? Yes, please. Okay, great. So, um, how many of you tried what we did yesterday? Got some challenges that you would want us to address today, or you found something new that you want us to address before we move on to the next thing? Any question from what we did yesterday? Maybe you tried it out and then it didn't work, or you found something different from what we learned yesterday. Actually, I was trying some, but I I was only getting the first part that we did. I didn't get the part that you were you redirected to Facebook and then Google stuff. And is, is it because you didn't understand or um, you didn't try it at all? I mean, I was trying it, but I couldn't get to the site. When I, I don't know, maybe it's, it's part of the fact that maybe I didn't understand okay. some or I, I don't know, but I tried. All right, so um, before I continue today, I'm just going to do um, a five minute recap. Let me take a watch so that I don't waste time. I'll do a five minute recap of what we did yesterday so that um, I'll bring each of you up to speed and then we continue from there. So um, the focus is to learn how to build web applications and APIs with Flask. And yesterday we spoke of how to create virtual environment. I told you why it is important to have a virtual environment to be able to have an isolated Python instance per project. You, you learn how to create virtual environment. And um, I think I still have, to be good if I close this browser, I still have window, uh, my terminal from yesterday. Where is that guy? Okay. So yesterday we worked with this terminal and as you can see, the app is still running. I did it yesterday and it's still running. So. Today, we are going to learn how to set HTML pages. So, um, you know that to create a Flask application, is you start by importing Flask from Flask. You create a Flask instance, and then you use the um, dot route decorator to decorate your functions. And so that is what makes the function become um, a view function or a view handler. And so the way it works is you just use the at app.route decorator and then you specify the url that you want to map onto the function so what happens is when a request comes to your web server which is called um, vexorge and you should only use it for development it is not for production use so when it comes in the the server is going to look at your you um, route mappings the url mappings and then it will invoke the correct view function. So when it sees that you are hitting slash hello slash some name, then it knows that you want it to call this hello, um, say hello function. If you just go to the root of the site, then it is going to serve you, um, this is my home site. And um, since yesterday, we, we returned all our responses to the clients, in this case, the browser as string, as test, but this is not very feasible. Like nobody builds a web application this way. We had to do it this way yesterday because I wanted to show you the simplest thing and then we grow from there. So um, today we are going to focus on how to use templates. And the way I want us to work is, I want us to go through the book I shared with you yesterday, step by step. I think it will be useful so that once we finish a section, you can go back to the book because I'll treat every section of the book with you. So you go back to the book with the understanding, the explanation I have given you, it should be easier. And um, you still have the book for references. I hope that that is going to be a better thing. So if you haven't downloaded the book, try and then get the book. And um, we also talked about how to use redirect. And um, we, we use a redirect to 
of course, redirect to another website. So when a request comes to the server and you want the, the, the user's browser to point to another website, you basically use a redirect. And the way to use a redirect is you need to import redirect from Flask, as you can see in line one. And then instead of returning a string to the client as a response, you return a redirect and then you paste in the URL that you want to route to. And then it is going to um, point the client to that URL. And then one other thing we talked of is aside using the at app decorator to uh, decorate your your functions to become view functions you can also use the app.add url rule and the way it works is that you you call app.add url rule you specify the url you give the endpoint name today we will use the endpoint name so you understand what it is and then you give the function that should be called in response to that url so basically what you are seeing here is when the user goes to slash face, um, fake facebook we want to call the function go to facebook and go to facebook what it does is to return a redirect to facebook.com so that was it about um, the redirect and we also spoke of how to run your application we saw that you could run it from the terminal by exporting or creating the flask app environment variable and then you can do flask run otherwise my favorite is to start your server programmatically. And the way to do it is you check if the name is equal to main, then you do app.run. So you can specify the host and you do 0.0.0.0 to make your application accessible outside your computer. Debug because true is going to turn on hot reloading and it's also going to make the debugger available in the browser. It is something you should not use in production because it gives a debugger in the browser which basically hands over access to your server to anybody who is viewing your website so you only do debug because true when you are um, building when you are developing the app once you are done you need to turn it off and we also spoke of how we can um, change the port number so by default flask runs on port 5000 and the way we can change it is to just specify port and then give it any port number that we want to run our application on so i'm going to get rid of everything here since you already have the video because today we want to start um, doing something a bit useful so now i have an empty um, flask application and as a matter of fact this is something you can run the only problem is there are no URLs that you can visit. So as you can see, the server is still running and um, I should be able to go to my browser. Let me open my browser. I think I have too many tabs open. Let me close, 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 close. And then I'll go to um, localhost 5000. And you see that now I'm getting not found because we haven't defined anything uh, any route handler for the root of our application, which is what we are going to do today. So our focus for today is in um, chapter, let me check the chapter, chapter three of the book. So I want us to treat a chapter every day so that by the end of Friday, tomorrow you will learn how to um, read and write from databases so that you can do persistent storage of data in your applications. And then um, the, on Thursday, we learn how to build JSON APIs. And then on Friday, we do a recap of the top stories and then how to deploy your application. So today our focus is on um, chapter three. Let me check again. Yeah, chapter three, templates. So you saw that the way we, hand, we built our handlers yesterday was to do this, um, the, the creator thing. And then I'll say dev index. And then I'll say return my home page. Now, if I save this and I refresh, you see my home page. The reason why I didn't have to restart the server is because I'm running in debug mode. So hot reload is um, working here. It identifies that I have changed the Python code. So the server restarts itself. Now, this is a very impractical and intractable way to build web applications. The reason why it is a problem is there is no separation of concern here. You can see that we are mixed, uh, we are mixing what we show in the browser with the python code that has to power the web application if we work this way the problem is that you can split your teams into front-enders and back-enders 
because that is how we work in industry. In industry, we have the front end people who focus solely on building the user mm -hmm. interface, which I am not good at. So don't expect nice looking user interfaces in um, this work in here. I can, I can give you very rascal ones. And then we have the back enders who focus on writing the core logic that powers the application. So it's like the back end is the engine of your car, and then the front end is everything that has to do with the dashboard, the, 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 the painting, and all those things. So if you 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 mix how to set up your route handlers with the um, web page itself, the UI this way, it becomes difficult for you to um, have a team that splits the workflows into two so that one group of people can focus on back end files, others focus on front end. Thankfully, Flask has a way of making it possible for us to serve um, uh, HTML web pages without having to write HTML in our Python code. And the way to do that is we start by creating a folder inside the root of your project. So the folder that contains our project is called Flask Webinar. Inside it, you create a folder called Templates. And it must be templates. It can't be anything else. If you want to change it into something else, then you want to go into um, Flask source code and then do some configurations, which I don't want to do now. Now, just take it from me that you create a folder called templates. And inside templates, you are free to put your HTML in there. So let's go ahead and then create um, some HTML inside templates. So I'm going to call um, something, say, home.html. Now I have home.html. I'm going to put some HTML5 boilerplate code in here. And then, um, let me close this guy. So I have my basic HTML. I'm going to change the title to um, Flask Webinar. And then inside the body, I'm just going to use an H1. H1 that we say, um, welcome to template and by the way the technology that is using uh is called ginger ginger template so i'm going to save this and then um inside the app.py i'm going to import one more function called render template okay what render template does is it helps you to specify an html file that you want the server to send to the client. So when the web request comes to the server, for example, if you go to Facebook, for instance, what happens is Facebook has um, HTML that is defining the page and everything. So you go to facebook.com, the server knows that, oh, you want to get the home page. So there's some HTML that is the home page that Facebook is going to fetch and then we'll spit it back to the browser, which is more elegant than what we are doing here by specifying my home page as a string. So the way to do that is you call render template and then you pass the name of the file you want to render. So inside templates, the file is called home.html. So I'll say home.html. Now let's save it and then rerun. And you can see that now instead of just send, spitting the string to the browser, we are actually serving HTML. How do you know you are serving HTML? You can inspect the web page because HTML is such that once it comes into the browser, anybody can see the source code. That if you go to Facebook and you want to see the HTML source code, just right click and then go to view page source. Any site at all, you see the, the, the source code in there. So if I view the page source, you can see that it is exactly what I wrote inside um, this HTML file over here. Any questions so far? Okay, so I'm happy everybody understands it. Now, because this is HTML, what happens is you can split your team into two and let some people, those who are front end guys, focus on building the front end and then those who are backend guys also focus on building the backend. So now that we have we have split um, the HTML, we have separated it from our Python source code, and all that we are doing is to say, return render template home.html. 
The backend guys can focus on working inside the Python file, whilst the front end guys focus on making things beautiful in the front end. So let's try to add um, a beautiful CSS framework to the web page so that it will it will readily um, um, begin to look nice. Okay. So what is going to happen is um, I can go to Bootstrap. So Bootstrap, which is the number one CSS framework out there. And then we just copy some code from Bootstrap and then paste it in our application. So Bootstrap is um, readily giving us a starter template that we can use. So what you can do is to just copy what is here. Uh, sorry. Just copy what is on the starter template and then I'm going to paste it in home.html. Then I will save. If I come back to the browser and I refresh, you see that now it has added some bootstrap styling, like the font has changed, the H1 elements, like it, the, the more we add things, you see that the, the web page is looking nicer and nicer and nicer. So that is basically it about templates. I'm going to change um, the title to Flask. Okay, let, 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 today we will try to do a project-based approach. So let's try to build a, a dashboard to represent um hello, hello, hello yeah please I, I didn't see how you paste um the, the file where did you paste it i didn't see the this where did you paste it so um i just went to bootstrap.com and then the, their starter template so bootstrap is basically a css javascript framework that they have created it is a front-end people who use it and i'm not a front-ender but when okay. you come there, they will show you how to like Basically, if you want to add nice things, uh, they, they, they have everything you need. Say you want to add nice buttons and all those things. So if you come okay. to their page and then you click on um, buttons, you can see that already you have some styled buttons there that you can use that you don't have to write code for. Okay. So that is um, Bootstrap. And what I did was I just came to their starter page. In fact, this code is good. Let me copy it so we can also see it. I just came to their starter page. If you come to their home page, they have a starter template that gives you the boilerplate HTML that you can use to start building your own web application. So I just okay. copied it. I just copied it by pressing Control C, or you can click Copy here, and okay. then I came to the template file that we created, the home.html, and I pasted it. That oh, okay. Started, yeah. And now I have even gone ahead to copy the buttons on their site, so I can let me format this code so that it looks nicer. Oh, damn. I don't have HTML format. Okay, enjoy yourself. So, I'm, I've copied the buttons that they are showing on their site, and then we will also see how it renders in our application. I'm just I'm trying to get my editor to format this, and it's telling me I don't have format. Okay, so let's go back to our web page, refresh, and you see that now the buttons are showing like um, they, they were showing in the CS, um, Bootstrap CSS, just that they are bigger here. I think there is something we are missing to, to add, but that will not be the focus. So for those of you who are front-enders, you can look into Bootstrap, definitely look into it. It is a, a very nice framework that makes it easy for people who suck at UI like myself to be able to build nice looking um, web pages. So, any question? No question. Hello, Brian. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do I dynamically insert um, the variables from the Python backend into the templates? There Great. Is, um, so double, so double. That, that is the next thing we are going to talk about okay. now. Okay. Yeah. Great. So. Why are the buttons big, big? Ah, I zoomed out. Okay. Nice. Uh -huh. So this is how the, the thing actually looks like. So these are buttons that Bootstrap have already styled for you. So to know how to use it, you actually have to read your documentation. But basically, you create an HTML tag button, you specify the type, and then you use classes to style your, your components. Okay. So let us assume that we are going to create a dashboard to report um, corona cases since we are in the corona season. So let's say we have a database of um, city, country, confirmed cases, number of deaths, 
and then those who have recovered is a sad example but i mean that's what we can all relate to so i'm going to use that as the example so let's try to build such a dashboard now he asked the question that you can see that now there is complete separation of consent between your python code and the html code mm -hmm. such that at this point if you are using a source control system like git your front enders will just keep coding they'll be coding in the template folder so they will be writing all their code in the template folder, the HTML, the styling, all the animation, the videos and everything. They can focus on working entirely in the template folder. They can add their files. And then you, the Python guy, will be working in your app.py. So you will be dealing with talking to the database, getting the data, handling authentication. Um, if it has, is a site that has to do with payment, you need to check that people can pay, blah, blah, blah. You are doing the core stuff and then they will also do the beautiful UI. So everyone is important in this game here. Now he asks the question that because you can see that there is a good separation mm -hmm. of consent between the Python file and the HTML file, the next question then becomes, how do you pass information from the Python side of your software to the HTML side. So it's basically how do you create a bridge between the back end and the front end? And it is super, super, super easy. So like I said, we are going to create a dashboard. Let's say we want to give our dashboard a title, okay? What you do is inside your view function, you define a variable that stores the data and then you make that data available when you are calling render template. So I'm going to say, title um I'm, I'm going to call something uh, um yeah let, let's just say dashboard title so there's a normal python variable for those who um, know python already so dashboard title and i'm going to say corona 2020 dashboard now the question is how do we make this Corona 2020 dashboard show up in the HTML. We don't want to come here. I mean, the simplest thing is we can come in here and hack our way around by saying H1 Corona, blah, 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 blah. Then I will save. And then we we'll refresh. So this is what I pasted in there. But this is not dynamic because I have hard coded it in the HTML. So his question was, how do you do something dynamic? How do you show something in the front end that originally came from the back end? And the way to do that in um, template is to use Jinja variables, okay? So the template engine we are using, I said it's called Jinja, J-I-N-J-A, Jinja 2. So I can come in here and then I'll just say dashboard title. Okay, now what, what, what this thing does, this is not a valid HTML. If I should open this HTML in the browser without going through the server, you see that it will not render. In fact, let me just save this and then I run through the server. You see that because, and the way you know you are going through the server is because you are going to localhost HTTP, um, HTTP colon slash slash localhost port 5000. It goes to the server. What happens is the server saw that you were trying to use a variable that doesn't exist and it didn't complain about it. Let's go and inspect the source code. You view the source code and you can see that what happens is the Jinja template lets you provide placeholders in your HTML. A placeholder is like you promise that there will be something there and that something is going to come from the Python side. So how it works is before the server sends the HTML to the browser, it is going to take the template, the HTML through the template engine. And it's the work of the template engine to fill in those placeholders. Let me show you why I'm talking plainly like that. So I'm going to open the HTML page inside um, a browser without going through the server. And the, what I mean is I'll just double click on it so that Chrome will open. See the difference? This one is not going through the web server. And you can see that I'm loading it from my file system. Users, Pi, desktop, class, webinar, template, home.html. See when we go through the browser, uh, when we go through the server. 
The server passed it through the template engine, and the template engine realized that you had a placeholder, but you didn't provide any value for it, and so it did not complain. But in regular HTML, see that it renders it as it is. So I, I don't want you to think like uh, maybe Jinja is a joke. Jinja is not a joke. It's a very powerful thing, and what it does is to replace those placeholders with real values. And how you do that is the next thing I'm going to show you. So. One more time, let's check the source code. See the source code for the HTML page I opened without going to the web server. You can see that it is verbatim, it is as it is, just as I pasted in there. But if I come to um, the one that goes to the server and I inspect the source code, you can see that it did something. It, it saw that I'm trying to use a placeholder that I didn't provide a value for, so it put an empty string there. Okay, great. So let's go and then see how we will be able to fill in the value. Now we have defined a variable, it's a Python variable, and we said dashboard title is Corona 2020 dashboard. And then I'm returning render template. So what I'm saying is just load the HTML, home.html, and send it to the browser. But inside home.html, I have a placeholder over here. It is called Jinja variable. And the way to do that is to bring two curly braces. So this is how you do it. Two opening, two closing, and then you put the variable inside. Oh, oh, sorry. So two opening, two closing, and then you put the variable name in there. Now, Jinja will be asking you, where do I get this dashboard title from? So when you are calling render template, you can specify that dashboard title is equal to dashboard title. I'll save this. I'll go back here, render, and see that the one that goes through the server is showing Corona 2020 dashboard. Let's see the HTML file that didn't go to the server. It is still showing dashboard in Kelly braces. So if you don't go through the Jinja template engine, in the Flask server, you can't do these tricks that we are doing in the front end. Okay, now you can see that in the source code, I said dashboard is equal to dashboard. Hello, hello, Edward. Yeah. Uh, is it possible that you know you can actually create a web page without not using the back end? As you said, you no, know, the HM you could go there without going to the server. Is it possible? Yeah, definitely. If if your front end is such that Okay, ask the question again. Is it possible to create a back end without a front end? Yes, is it possible to create a front end without a back end? Yes, but but that, that is really without yeah. going to the server. So that as you know, you, you pass you either you did two ways, you can either pass it to the back end, then you pass it to the server. Okay. And you also did why you didn't pass to the server. I yeah. saw two there are two different things. I'm asking, is it possible that you can do them separately? As in, someone can create a website without not going to the back end. As in, just doing only the front side and moving on. Definitely. Like, if you are working on a government of Ghana website, which never gets updated. Okay. Food. Yeah, I mean, if you like, go to go to uh, 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 presidency.gov.gh and go and see that uh, uh, Kotoka and them, their information will still be there because Nobody has time to update it. So if you are building a, a, a government of Ghana website, definitely you can do that. But for oh, modern yeah. web applications, that is dynamic. Like, you know, the beauty of modern web application is you want to customize the app for the user, each user. It's like Facebook. When you open Facebook, you see different things. When I open, I see different things based on <laughs> my usage behavior, what Facebook has learned about me. And if you okay. do just static pages, you can't add this uh, dynamism. Okay, okay, okay. So I get you. I, get, I understand that. Thank you. Yeah, great. So, so yeah. yeah. So talking about dynamism and stuff, let's say you have... Okay, when you create a, a website, mm -hmm. there should be regular updates and stuff. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, do you update both the front end and the back end? Or one, one group will be doing the updates and stuff? It, it depends on your team structure. It depends on how you structured your team. I mean, I was telling you yesterday that if you take this webinar thing serious, 
you are becoming a full stack developer. A full stack developer means you do back end, you do front end. Okay. Unfortunately, I'm not good enough to teach you front end, front end, but Eric is going to do a webinar on like solid front end. Once you learn that, you become a full stack developer, which means as you are there now, you can think of any idea and build it from start to finish without requiring anybody to help you. I am not able to do that. If I want to build a sweet thing, I do the back end and I call somebody who is in the front end, pay the person and work with the person so that it will look nice because it's not my, my skills. You, you get a point. Okay, so let, uh, if I create a website for, let's say, a company, who is responsible in doing the, I mean, updating and changing stuff on the website? It depends on the contract you signed with them. So if the contract was such that, build it for us and hand over the source code to us. And by the way, take this from me. Any software you write, you have the copyright over it in, in software law. Even for companies that you work for, I don't know which of you work for companies now, but the, the contract between you and the company is that the code you write is your intellectual property. It belongs to you. But the company gives you salary in exchange of that thing that you have built. So that is what gives you the, the power, gives the company the power for you to give them the source code, but it actually belongs to you. So it depends on the contract you signed with the people. If you are such that, can build us a, a, an application and go away. Cool. Always ask them, do you want me to build it one time and then update, you'll find somebody to do it. If they say fine, most of them, they won't say fine because nobody wants to come and maintain what you have done. It is easier if you maintain it. But if they say yes, then you build it, you give them the source code and over. However, mostly you will build it and then they'll be asking for updates. Now, where you change the code depends on what update they have asked for. Let me use Tonaton for example. Let's say now Tonaton, you can't pay. You can't pay. I can just come and view the classified uh, ads and then I'll phone in and then I'll have to meet with a person. But let's say for some reason, Tonaton say they want to go a step ahead and they make it possible for people to pay on their site. Where the change will happen is going to be on both sides because the back end people have to integrate into payment APIs like Visa, mobile money and stuff like that. You have to write code to talk to the telecom companies that somebody is paying, blah, blah, blah. And the front end people also have to modify the user interface so that you can click some button and enter your mobile money details or your Visa card details and then it will go. Okay. okay. Now let's assume that Tonaton already has payments and then let's say what they say is okay now we just want to change the payment processor the company that processes the payment itself as long as they are not going to change user interface the front end people don't need to touch anything it is the back end people so let's say initially um payment processing was done by um, express gh and now they want to change it to insano or ranka or um there is this nigerian payment company i've forgotten or paystack then it's only the back-end people who mostly have to do work. So it depends on what change you are asking for. You get it? It's like it's like your car. If your car's engine breaks down, you're not going to call a sprayer. So think of the front-end guy as a sprayer, the person who makes the car look nice. And think of the back-end guy as the guy who lets the car move. So if your car breaks down by the roadside and a sprayer comes and he says, oh, me too, I'm a sprayer. If you're not careful, you slap him, especially if your car is an expensive car. You don't want a sprayer to open your engine. You, you get a point. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Perfect. So a full stack, the scenario I want to give you, a full stack person is like a mechanic who knows how to spray, who knows how to pump ties, who knows how to do electrical work, who knows how to fix air conditions. That is what um, um, a full stack person does. And by the way, it's a... Uh, it's a wax. All right. So, hello, hello, Python. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> let me let me also chip in this. So actually, of late, we don't actually uh, waste time building those kind of static files where at one point you have to go and change things. What we do is we create dynamic settings files. Maybe in your, your there is a file called .env. You can put site wide uh, settings like the site title, some images. For example, whenever I build any web application, I make sure the only structure in the HTML is the layout. Every data is coming from the website. So anytime I want to change the view, I don't even touch the, the HTML. 
I just put in the data from my back end and it's going to load all the images and whatever classes that I want. So right now, a lot has changed. You don't create HTML and be changing them over. It's boring. All right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that, that is it. So it's all about creating dynamic web pages so that um, things will change. You want, the, you want the UI to change as your database changes, not as um, people want you to change. I mean, that, that's it. Okay. So any, any other question before I continue? Okay, so um, I was talking of how you pass the data to the front end. I said dashboard title is equal to dashboard title. Some of you might be confused like, ah, should it be the same? No. The one on the left, dashboard title, this, the one on the left, refers to the variable name that you used in your HTML. And then the one on the right is what you want to substitute in place. So I can even call this page title. And then I'll come here and then I'll say dashboard title is equal to page title. What it means is that when you are rendering this template, read this code this way. The code says render template home.html dashboard title is equal to page title. What it means is that render this home.html to the client. Whilst rendering, you will see a variable called dashboard title. In place of that dashboard title, put whatever is in page title there. If I save, I come, I refresh in the one that goes to the server. You see that nothing changed. If I go to the one that doesn't go to the server, it is clueless. It has no idea what that thing is supposed to do. So you don't necessarily have to say um, uh, the, the variable on the left and the right shouldn't have the same name. The takeaway is the variable on the left is the variable name you used inside your um your page and then the variable on the right is what you put in place of it do you understand okay so i'm going to take that as I understand it now. thank you okay great so I'll, I'll do one more and um to show you that you can also do control structures in templates you can do if statement you can do for because of course we use a for loop to um, create the table that we want to create but before then i want to show you how to use an if statement so we haven't done databases we'll do that tomorrow so now i won't do anything that talks to a database so all our data models will be like we'll simulate that in python so let's assume that you want to show one thing to the user if the user has logged in and another thing, if the user has not logged in, how will you do that? You see, this, this is why dynamic front end is nice. So let's come in here. I'll declare a variable um, has logged in or has authenticated, or I can say authenticated is equal to false. Okay. And then over here, I will say, um authenticated my my code is getting long so i'm going to break it into multiple lines so i'll say render home.html i'll say dashboard title is equal to page title and then i'll say um i'll say authenticated because authenticated. Now, it is not an error for you to make a value av available in render template and not use it in the, in the HTML. It's not a problem. If I go, um, Flask is not going to complain about it. But in the front end, I want to check if you have logged in or you have not logged in. We want to show you different things because if you go to Facebook and you have not logged in, Facebook will take you to the home page. But if you have logged in, then they will show you things on your news feed and stuff like that. So let's say on our page, we also want to simulate that thing. What we can do is we will use a control structure and note the difference between a control structure and the um, variable substitution. So for variable substitution, I just said two curly braces. But for a control structure, you use opening curly brace percentage sign and then you close it with a corresponding one so i'll say if 
authenticated. So I want to show one thing if you have authenticated. So I'll say end if. It's like you are writing some logic in your HTML. This thing is not valid in HTML. The only thing that makes it valid is the Jinja template engine, which is going to run over it and then put values in place. So if authenticated, then I want to um, I want to say, let's say what 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 nice thing in that um, bootstrap. I'm, I'm looking for something nice we can use to render. So um, content content typography. Yeah, I want I want to render something that will look nice. So H1, H2. Um, yeah, I can use display. I can use display, or maybe even lead. Yeah. So I'm going to copy how they do their stuff, and over here I'll paste it in there, and then I'll change what you see in here. So let's say if you have logged in, then I want to show welcome and then your name. For now, let's assume the person's name is um, who is popular in Ghana, Bukum Bankum. So I'll say. Welcome, Bukum, Bankum. Okay. And then we can do an else. So I can come in here and say else. Then I want to say, um, I mean, we can show a button for you to log in or something. So I can do a form. And then I can do input. And then I will say, um, what else can I specify in an input? Placeholder is um, email address. And then over here too, I can do input password and then placeholder. Um, placeholder is equal to password. So this is purely HTML. This one, you, you, you have to know HTML. I don't even know HTML. This is what they taught me in KUSD and thankfully I've not forgotten. So let's go back here and refresh our web page. And then we are seeing Corona um 2000 and then it is putting a form there why because i said if authenticated then show welcome else what did i say okay yeah so the the logic is inside the the html we want to check if the user is authenticated then we want to show welcome bukum banku we are assuming that the user's name is bukum banku Otherwise, we want to present you the login form for you to go and log in. Okay. Now, because I set in app that authenticated is false, in the HTML, when Ginger is rendering the template, it will check authenticated. Is it true or false? It is false. So it won't render everything that is in here. Then it will come to the else. It's like a normal if else. Then it will render the form. Let's go back and then change authenticated to true. And then I'll go back to the browser, refresh, and you can see that it's the same HTML page, but it's doing different things depending on the value that comes from the backend. So now it is assuming that you are authenticated simply because I came in here, I came in here and I changed authenticated to true. And then inside HTML, I'm checking if authenticated, show welcome bukum banku this is normal html so that jinja um, construct is just helping us to structure our page and add the dynamism in there else we show a form that you have to use to um, log in and unfortunately our form doesn't have a button but i think we can add one so button and then i can say class is equal to btn and then bt and um, success i think th this ones th these things i'm typing is coming from bootstrap so um, don't worry your head over it too much if i come here and i change authenticator to false then i want to see my form and then a button yeah so i didn't add a 
test. So let's say login. So if I come back here and I refresh, you see that now we have a form to log in if you have not authenticated. But if you have authenticated, then we will show you your username. You can go a step further and then just say, instead of showing Bukum Bank, we want to even fake a username here. So I'll say username is equal to John Muhammad. Okay. Now, once I do this, I can supply username back to the um, front end. And like I said, the variable names don't have to be the same. This, that is a good habit. So I come in here and instead of saying what can Bukum Bank, I'll use the variable substitution. Because see, if you are using an if statement, which is a control structure, you do curly brace percent. But if it is just a variable you want to substitute, you just do two curly braces. Then I'll show username over here. So I'll go back here, refresh, because authenticated is false. If I come and I say authenticated is true, I expect to see, um, I expect to see John Muhammad. So I'll add welcome. John Muhammad. So let's go back here, refresh, and then you can see that it is saying welcome John Muhammad. Any question? Because I know you have a lot of questions. Ask them and then let's take a break. Any question? Or oh, you guys are understanding it? Yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask about the control structure, but I think that from your explanation, I've understood it. Um, okay. The control structure and the uh, where you substitute. If I want to go over what, I, what I'm saying is true, with the control structure, it's when you have probably a statement. What, when it's a logic statement, something that exactly. is logic. Exactly, exactly. So anything that is logic or a loop. A loop. But when, when, when it's a substitution, it's straight, straight for you. A variable you just conduct a substitution. Exactly. Exactly. So the substitution helps, uh, you use it to let the HTML show the value of the variable you put there. And then the okay. control structure, you, you use it to add some Okay, okay, yeah. okay, yeah. okay. okay. thank you. Yeah. Hello, bye. Yeah. Yeah, so with what you just did, let's say the, the login stuff, mm -hmm. the authentication. If, let's say, you go to Facebook, you need to log in first before you get access. So is it that there is always this true or false thing or it's something that changes because how will it, is it going to be? Nice question. So I am faking this because I haven't taught you how to read and write from databases which we will do God willing tomorrow. But the true thing is you will actually have to go into a database. So the, the flow will be that you go to the web page, you enter your username and password. It will come to the back end. The back end will take your username and password from the form. And then it will go into the database, check that you have your username, you have your password, yeah, correct. Then it will set authenticated is true. Otherwise, it will say false, so that the page will not change when you see what false. But because I have not taught in databases, that's why I'm faking it. Right. Well, okay, 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 yeah. okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's take some maybe seven minutes break. It is. It is 8.57 at my end, so that is going to be 6.57 at your end. Let's be back by um, 7 minutes time, which is 4. So, um, 9.4, and then it's going to be your 7.4. So, you guys can prepare your questions, or if there is anyone who understood it, you can also explain it to your friends. The best way to understand something is to teach. So. I mean, I'm not leaving. I'm yes, 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 yes. Please, someone should do that. Some okay. Some of us just join. <laughs> so, well, anybody who understands, like the guy who was in the house, help your friends. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Internet connection was very bad, so I had to change my location. So, who is volunteering? Eric, you should do that.
and you want to check the data type of age. This is telling me age is an integer, but you see that when we check for the data type of K, it said Kofi is a tuple. So to declare a tuple, you just use the um, bracket and then you give comma se separated values, which are the, the attributes that you want to store. So basically I am saying that the first thing is the first name. This is the last name. This is the department. This is the person CWA. So to get Kofi's first name, what I need to do is I'll say Kofi and then I will index zero because a tuple is an index data structure. So if I say K zero, it's going to give me Kofi because K zero, the item at the zero index is the first name. If I say K one, if I say K one, that is going to give me the last name. If I say K two, it's going to give me the department. And if I say K three, it's going to give me the CWA. Is this clear up to this point? I just want to like give you a address or hazard of um, tuples and lists before we go back to using it in Flask. Does this make sense? Yeah, it is clear. Makes sense. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to show you another data type. Let's say you want to store um, the name of the um, capitals, capital cities in the world. So I will say cities is equal to to create a list, that one you use the square bracket. A tuple is the normal bracket, and then a list is a square bracket. So I'm going to just put in a list of cities. So I'm going to say Accra, London, New York, uh, Berlin, um, Amsterdam. So let's check the type. If you check the type of cities, Python will tell you that the type is a list. Now, if I want to loop over list, I just have to say for, let's say C in cities. I want to print the city name. So I'll just print C. So what this piece of code here does is, it is saying that for, so this is how you read Python code. For each C in cities, so the C stands for the individual cities that you have in there. And because it's a for loop, it's going to loop over them. So it will start and then set C to Accra. On the next iteration, C is London. On the next, it is New York. On the next, it is Berlin. On the next, it is Amsterdam. So if I print, then it prints everything in there. Now, the good thing about Python list is that a list can contain other lists and other tuples. So let's say I'm going to create information about um, two people here. So um, let me check some of you, your names. I see Isaac Atta and Emmanuel Atta. So let's say I, I want to store information about these two people and I'm assuming they are brothers. So I'll say um, brothers, brothers, it's equal to a list of tuples. So the first tuple is going to represent Emmanuel Atta. So I'm going to put Ima as the first name. The last name is Atta. And then I'm going to give him a fictitious age, like 25. And then I'll come and then create for the other Emmanuel, um, for the other Isaac. And then he's also Arthur. And I will assume that he is on um, to overgrown. So he is 78 years old. Now what happens here is brothers is a list of tuples where each tuple contains information about a particular person. So if I want to look over, I can say for, let's say bro, I mean, it's a variable name, you choose anything. I can even say for person in brothers, okay? So what, what happens here is, then what is it? For person in brothers. So what happens here is, it is going to loop through, but this time it is going to select each tuple because it is a list of tuples. So I can get each brother, print the name and then the age. So I can say 
print and i'm going to use um python f string f strings makes you do something similar to what we were doing with ginger so i'm going to say f name and then i'll put the person's first name there so i'll say um person and then the first name is at the zeroth index so i'll put zero here and um, i'm going to show their age as well so i will just come here and then i'll say um, person one which is the age so if i run this code what did i miss string expecting didn't i close something uh, f name is equal to oh damn now i need to repeat this whole thing okay so let me let me come okay and then i will say print i left one um kelly brace it was expecting a kelly brace here I think this should fix it. Okay, so you can see that now it went through the, the brothers that I created here. And then for each of them, it showed the first name and then the age. Because I use the index zero and then index one, which um, refers to, oh, sorry, instead of two. So if I wanted the age, I should have used two, sorry. So because I used one, it is showing their last name. But the, the basic idea here is I want to show you how to loop over a list of tuples. Is that correct? Is it is it clear? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, it's clear. It's okay. Okay, thank you. So we are just going to do the same thing in our, in our Python code. So I'm going to quit this terminal. And then I'm going to run our server again. Great. And um, so over here, we have something similar to the brothers list of tuples that we created. And we want to pass it onto the front end so that we can use it to create a table in the front end. What's going to happen is we come here and then I will, I will say records is equal to records. I'm not passing username and all that because we don't need them anymore. So I come in here, I wipe everything. Let me save and refresh. So we have a beautiful error. It is saying name error, authenticated is not defined. It means I am using authenticated somewhere that I have not defined it. And you can see that over here, I'm saying authenticated is got to authenticated, even though I've not declared it anywhere. So that is the um, debugger at work. I refresh and problem solved. Great. So when you get errors, just read them. And then when, whenever you see name error, it means you are using a variable that you've not defined or declared, simple. So now dashboard title is coming from Corona 2020 dashboard. Records, we want to make use of records. Before we do anything, let's try to just spit out records into the, the page and let's see. Let's see what we get. This is Python, we can't break anything. So you see, I brought Python, I, I brought the, the records into the HTML by just putting the variable name in there and it renders it just as we place there. But this is not nice looking. This is not a good way to um, present something to um, your users. So let's try to create, let's be good people and then create um, the nicest UI I can create. So I think I can do um, container, and um, I can do, uh, by the way, this container things I'm doing is not part of the Flask course. It is bootstrap. The little bootstrap I'm doing is what I'm using to scare you. I'm not that good, so don't learn bootstrap from me. I'm just using bootstrap to make the page look a bit easier. Okay, let me see. I, I want you to center the thing. Yeah, so I have, I have it centered now. And then we want to render our table. So what's going to happen is um, I will come in here and I'm going to put an HTML table. I've even forgotten how to create a table in HTML thanks to the internet. So HTML table. Then let me go to W3 schools. You see, this is how you learn. 
you've forgotten something, just Google it out and see how it is done. So basically, I need um, a table and then I need table row and then table data. Okay, so I'm going to create a table. So I'm going to create a table in here. And then I'm going to create a table head with TH. Oh, what did I do? TH. So table head and what goes into table head. Okay, I need a row and then the, the table head in there. The table row, TH. And so we want to show the CT. We want to show the country. We want to show confirmed cases. We want to show dead. We want to show recovered. Let's refresh our page and see what we're getting. Okay, so we have a very ugly looking table. Let me go to Bootstrap and see how we can make our table nice. Bootstrap for table. I'm showing you how to work, okay? So learn it as part of it. I go to Bootstrap and Bootstrap says, if I want a nice looking table, I should just set the class to table. So I'm going to come to this and I'll say this is table. Let's go back, refresh. Yes, we have a nicer looking table. So you see that the advantages of using Bootstrap, like it makes bad people like myself able to do um, some sweet UI. Okay, so now we have Bootstrap, the structure of our table. And we want to be able to create the other rows, okay? So we come in here and then we have to use a for loop because the first one has created a table head. So this is just the column headers that we have created. But now we actually want to loop over the data in here and render each one of them inside its own cell. So what is going to happen is we need to loop for every, for every record in records, for every record in records we need to create a table row and table cells for it. So we are going to use the control structure called for. Okay. And then I'm going to put a corresponding end for. So I'll say for record in records. Where is records coming from? Records is coming from these records we have defined here and we are passing it to render template. So it means inside the template, there is a variable called records that contains all this information. And now we are going to loop over to render. So I will come in here and then I will say, um, for each one of them, I need a table row. So a TR, I'll need a TR. And then I'll need a TD to show the city and the city is at record zero let's let's see what we get with th just this simple um, example i know this is not going to work i'm going to leave it to you as um, as an exercise i'll give you one minute to figure out why it will not work so i'm expecting that i will look at the table and as you see kumase Accra, berlin vicenza wuhan i know it's not going to work why is it not going to work so why, why am i seeing this instead of actually seeing the values Who will tell me the answer for many, many books? Hello, Edward. Yeah. I, I, I think um, when you can go, come back to the, the, the Visual Studio Code, and I was, let me. Okay. No, the right. Visual Studio Code. The Visual Studio Code. Yeah, I'm here. Visual Studio Code. I'm not seeing it all. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So you see, that's the reason why it's not coming because, you know, we, we, we created a variable called records. So if you want to index the city, it's supposed not. It's not supposed to be rec, okay, but it's supposed to be records, so that index then zero. Then maybe probably command to come or something. Yeah, but you see, the records is a rec a list of tuples, okay? okay. So over here, when I say for rec in records, rec stands for every single row like this, okay? Okay. That's what it stands for. So okay. why why is it not rendered? 
It is because I'm doing a variable substitution and I forgot to add the two Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Exactly. So now yeah. I'm going to go and then refresh it. And you see that now we are getting our cities showing nicely in the table. So we we'll go ahead and then we we'll do the same thing for the remaining items. So the country is at index one, the confirmed cases index two, dead index three, recovered index four. Let's save this, refresh. Do you get it? Uh, yeah, it's okay now. It's okay. So now let's go back to the page we render without Jinja and see what we get. It is an ugly looking table that doesn't know what it is doing because it hasn't gone through Jinja. So you see what Jinja does for you. Jinja actually adds some dynamism to your page and is able to replace um, placeholders with real values from your, your, your um, data structures, from your variables. So this is what went through Jinja. This is what didn't go through Jinja. And if you come here and you inspect the source code, you see that Jinja actually loops through and it actually inserts everything. See, as a matter of fact, if I copy this and I paste it and I render in this page, it is going to look exactly like what Jinja produced. So Jinja is just a template engine that goes through your template, replaces all the placeholders, and then it comes back to you nicely. So um, for, for, for the person who was asking questions about um, why do we need a dynamic website, this is one advantage. So now, if they come, so, so let me show you something. If you build this website and um, let's say you are doing election reporting, okay? You are reporting for election 2020 and you build a static website. Ask yourself how many times you have to edit your page for, for, for you to be updating each constituency's result. However, if you do a dynamic web application, all you need to do is to insert it into your database and you don't touch your front end. Right now, if I come here and I come and add Takrade, I don't need to touch anything in the HTML at all. So I'm going to say Takrade, um, Ghana. Let's say they have 10 cases, zero deaths, let's say one recovering. I just change what is my data. You see that I have not touched the HTML file. I just come here, I refresh. And there we have it. I didn't spell the tag really well. So I just come in here. I spell it correctly. I save, I refresh, and boom, there we go. So you see that the more you add things, I can, I can actually just copy and repeat the, the whole data set again, just to have a longer looking table. Then I'll save come back here refresh so are you are you getting the benefit of um, um, having a dynamic web application now yeah, I think so yeah. it's, 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 it's far better <laughs> so um, I think I have bombarded with you with a lot of information today even though i mean we've covered the most important aspect of the templating we are left with um, uh, macros which helps you to create something like a function that i want to be easy on you guys so let's pause here ask your questions get clarifications you have the books so read the books and the best way to learn is not watch me do it this is a webinar so yes you, can, you might not be able to code along but you have the book read the book, do every single thing the book does. That is the best way to learn programming. Don't learn programming like you are reading a storybook. It doesn't work that way. Write every single code. It is a painful thing you need to do, but once you have done it, the rewards are far richer. So write every single code in the book, understand it. Even now you might think, oh, I don't understand it. You might want to give up. It is because you are not writing the code. If you sit and you write the code, it will surprise you where the understanding will come from. So let's take some questions and then um, we, we, we move on. Hello, Edward. Yeah. yeah. I would like to say thank you so much for today's. Um, I fully understood most of everything you said today. 
Thank and you. I'm so grateful. And right now, my, my handle is to go to yesterday's owner. So, but I don't know if somebody on 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 the, on the meeting can help me, you know, so that I can able to create a visual environment and then probably do it on my own. I don't know if someone can. Are, are you on Windows? Yeah, I'm on Windows. Yeah. Okay, so um, let me look for um, maybe a YouTube video that someone has okay. left. Okay. Okay. Um, and I'll share okay. a link so that all of you can can watch it. Okay. By the way, um, I just I just copied this class from CSS. They call it table that I think it's going to make the table that can let me see. I mean these these are just yeah, yeah, they're nice. Please can you repeat what you said? Uh, on on what specifically? On like what you copied from. Ah, so I just copied um, a table class called table that and I added it to my table here. So CSS and Bootstrap made my table that, which is nice. On my own, I can write uh, um, uh, CSS to make the table look like this. I mean, this is the nicest UI I can do. <sighs> so um, what 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 we will do, God willing, tomorrow is we will continue from this project, but what we will do is we will add buttons that you can click to add new records. You save it into a database, and then we we'll fetch from the database to render. Because that's the most important thing. So, so that now it is like you can you can have this in when you hear that oh um, this place have got this number you just go and you update it and then it shows on your dashboard like something something simple that you can play with in this uh, season. And the reason I chose the example is it is the reason why we are all here today. So let's honor it whilst it lasts. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful. Alright. Okay. So yeah, let me look for okay. that video. Yeah, I'm listening. Uh please, would the video would the video be available? Yeah, so Eric um, usually hosts it the next day. So he hosted yesterday's own this morning. Okay. Yeah. So Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you very much for today. All right, thank you too. So um I think let, let me see this video if it makes sense. So if it's not to nice. It's recommend. Okay. Oh man, you you, you want somebody to install yeah, virtual box? Right click on that and no, I want virtual okay, it's environment. Files files in the Hello. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I promised recording one. Just yeah. I had I had two videos. Uh, oh, to oh, I could do a to differentiate. I think this video will be good. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You can actually do that. So. I'm going to share this with you. So for those of you who are struggling to um, set up virtual environments on your machine, but the, the best the best thing is, guys, try and get yourself involved in Linux. Try as much as possible to get yourself involved in Linux because there are not many places you can work as a developer and use Windows. Trust me, it's only in Ghana that developers okay. windows yeah okay so if you don't want to be a village champion start getting involved with Linux. if you want to be able to make Ghana a bit try and stay away from windows leave windows for the um, 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 graphic designers okay even they they are investing in Macintosh okay with that Yeah, so questions, questions, questions. Ask if you don't ask questions, you say that I didn't teach well or I have confused you so much you are pissed off with me. So ask questions. It can be about what we did or any any general question like we did yesterday. I just feel like you've had too much information overload that I need to pause. And since you have the book, you can continue from there. So any question? Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, hi, please wanted to ask one. Um, looking at the records, uh, is that where the database would be placed after we have done with everything? Yes. So yes. if it was coming from a database, you'll be talking to either MySQL 
Oracle, um, SQLite, or anything. God willing, tomorrow we will use SQLite so that you don't have to deal with installing MySQL and all that. SQLite comes with Python by default. But if we were reading from a real database, we wouldn't have to hard code all these things. We we'll write Python code to fetch from the database and then we will render it. But because we don't have that, that's why we are hard coding them in here. If it's a real database, you will see Pumasigana and blah, blah, blah. No, the database has a way of bringing them to you as um, Python yes. subjects, and yes. you will have to submit it over. Okay. But um, would that mean that you have to prepare the data? Assuming you get the data in oh, Amaz, yes. like um, in, in maybe in a Word document or something like that. Doesn't mean you have to do data preparation before you put it inside. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You, need, you need to prepare it and put it in the database. So if, if um, the project you are working on is such that they are giving you some Excel file and they want you to make the data from that Excel file available in your web application, you definitely have to prepare it, pre-process it, and actually enter it into the database. And for that, I will personally use Python. So I'll use Python to read the data from Excel, insert it into the database, and then build my application to read from the database. I won't do it one by one. Imagine um, um, you go to... <laughs> Um, um, any of the uh, government agencies and they give you an Excel file, which you shouldn't be surprised when they give you an Excel file in 2020, because that is all they know. And um, to have millions of records, you can't possibly go through one by one and then change things. So you definitely want to write code to do that. But yes, you need to find a way to get your data into the database. Okay. Any other question? So, w w which one of you works um, in a in a software company, and uh, what what do you do? Like, any one of you can share what you do with us. None of you are working already. Okay, so you are all still in school. How about internship? Um, the thing is, some of us we are done. With, some of us are done with school. Okay. But we are working, but not in a software company. We are now trying to transition into the software industry. Yeah. So we are learning. So okay. I'm uh, about yeah. Okay. So may may I ask what your background is? Okay. I did I did actuarial science. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah, so, and, and how is the transition going so far? Because um, it's, it's, it's a very valid thing you are doing. And uh, the reason I'm asking this is I want to see if your timeline is realistic enough and then also uh, give you any advice on how you can speed it up. So within how many months are you looking at um, transitioning into a software engineer? Okay, um, that's why I asked you the question yesterday. So when you mentioned um, if you actually had an exposure to the language, it would take less than eight months to do that. So that's actually what sticks in my mind and probably I will go by that and try to stick to that and work. I mean, um, take it with a grain of salt. It is not um, a definite timeline. If I say eight months, it is eight months of dedication, determination. So, so let me show you how I learned programming. So, I did computer science for the first three years. I didn't have a laptop. I, me, I'm a very, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a village boy. I'm from a village, so I didn't have a laptop. For three years, I, I was using people's laptop to practice. And because I didn't have a laptop, when I, whenever I get somebody's laptop, like I really use it. I use it to practice coding, coding, coding. So you are fortunate to have laptops now. You have internet around. Eight months is definitely doable but you need to be um, dedicated and you need a discipline. So the, the way you can expedite this is, don't just um, watch video tutorials. It is deceptive. You can watch tutorials and then you feel you know the thing until they actually ask you to do something. And especially because you haven't had an experience in uh, software engineering already and your background is not in computer science, it, it can be tough for um, tech companies to hire you because one, you didn't do computer science. So the way you can win the game so that they will hire you over a computer science student is that you will write more code on your own. Build 
plenty project like plenty project any project that you think of even something that you think is stupid build it anyway build it create an account on github push it there push it there push it there because one of the things um hiring managers look at is how often you write code because it's a measure of um, how sharp your skills are for example Will you, will you buy a football player who hasn't played matches in two years? You won't, right? No, yeah. Yeah. And because GitHub is what we all use, one way that they, 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 they used to hire is to actually check your GitHub activity. So let me open, let's say, um, this is my GitHub page, for example. So this, this map here, it shows how often I am pushing code, okay? and it, it is it goes by the years so for somebody who is getting started one way to showcase your interest in um, coding is to actually create an account on github and push anything like anything at all that you are working on just push your code there if you push it on github you can access it anywhere in the world all you need is internet connection push it push it push it write lots of code so when you go for an interview and they want to measure how much you enjoy writing code. This is one way they can see that there are people whose uh, uh, GitHub listing is filled up. It is not always the best measure, but for somebody who is starting, they want to see that you are motivated enough to write a lot of code. So it is definitely going to be a challenge for you, but um, definitely do it because it is very rewarding. And always get in touch. If, if you need any help, just get in touch and then let's see how best we can expedite this. Okay. Even getting an entry level job either in Ghana or yeah, now getting it in Ghana will be much easier. So Okay. Thank you for your advice. You're welcome. Yeah, so questions. Did your knobs? You've not spoken since we started. Oh, okay. No more questions. Mohammed, no question. Um, not yet. <laughs> So how, how has it been so far, like this webinar, the, the first two days? Oh, I you think it is tough, it is smooth? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 it's been good, yeah. We've actually learned and learned a lot, yeah. Okay. For me, I've learned a lot theoretically, so. I've been, okay, so I think you have to practice as well. Maybe as he's doing. Um, because I practiced what we did yesterday, I was able to code along as well. So yeah. I'm able to display the dashboard as well. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 there is no two ways about it when it comes to learning programming. There is no two ways about it. The best way to learn programming is to actually sit down and write code. You can't, you can't do it like you are reading a book or you are watching a movie. And it is even more deceptive when you are watching video tutorials. Never ever know the video tutorial into your into or on your computer and sit back and watch it like you're watching a movie that's not learning that is not learning it will surprise you you watch the tutorial right now and tomorrow they ask you to reproduce what you watch and you can't but if you watch and then you practice there are some subtle uh, mistakes one thing about video recording is the person recording the video edits it one that is one thing you people don't um, remember they, it is edited so when I'm recording, or let's I want to genuinely show the mistakes I made so that people can learn from which I do all the time. Me, I don't edit my videos, I just record my posts. But people spend a lot of time to edit, so they remove all the mistakes and all those things. You not see, but the learning comes from making the mistakes. It comes from making the mistakes. So if you are watching it, they have edited it and everything's working smoothly, it will surprise you that you will watch the whole course and uh, something something will be missing. So yeah. So question, questions, questions. Eric. Yo, are they? Yeah, so what, what do you want to tell your people? I think we have nine minutes more. Yeah, yeah, they should still ask questions. We have more time.
Okay, I think there is no more question, Eric. Maybe we can. All right. You can. All right. All right. All right. The last all right. time. Okay. So, um, hello, everyone. Yep. Yeah, I trust today was high some too, right? Yeah, one thing I've realized yeah, of for, course. for every uh, programming session, it's uh, it's usually not exponential decrement, but uh, yeah, there is a decrement. <laughs> that one you can't stop it. Okay, so um, tomorrow we will have another session. Okay, it continues till till Friday. So like he keeps on saying, uh, the learning aspect is when you do it on your own okay here is a lecture so he comes talk blah 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 now you have to step back and try things out okay we all pass through it sleepless nights i was teaching in um, la paz i will be sitting on the computer so the next day back go to work and then be sleeping in class yet we still didn't give up bad internet and like he said i i actually also when I was in first year, I didn't own my own PC. Even 2008, when I started doing uh, MS-DOS, I was using one of my students' PC. But the thing is, determination rules them all. You can always do anything when you are determined. That one. And uh, there was this guy, when I was in first year, called Tony, a bit of mine, that I used to use as PC. In the end, I became a programmer. He did not. Every weekend, he would borrow, he would lend me his PC, and by the time he comes on Monday, huh, I mean, like I know that the PC is lightweight. So you don't have any, you don't actually have any excuse not to learn programming. Seriously, you have no no excuse because right now data is available, video tutorials everywhere. I keep on uh, pestering you with this tutorial. So look. If after after two years you don't know how to code, yeah, Charlie. Then the people doing you, they are wearing they are wearing kambu. <laughs> so please let's let us. I know it's not easy for beginners, but then yeah, it eventually becomes easy. That is the thing. It eventually becomes easy. It gets to a point where you see code, you see error, and you are not bothered. <laughs> you. You, you, you are told something and you don't even waste time to put a computer to try it because you can run everything in your head and even know. You will get to that point, but then it takes continuous motion. Even now, every morning I do two hours coding. I'm trying to be one of the people who can push code to C++ code days. So that is, that is my challenge for this year and every morning I am learning C++, every aspect of it. I'm following this guy, the Beyond Strauss shop, the inventor of C++, his books, his talks, and all this. So we all do learn. Okay, we all do learn. Next, uh, I think next three weeks or something, I'll be teaching app scripts, how to use Google's applications and stuff. These are things that I haven't used that much, but then I will learn it in order to be able to teach you. So that means I have to keep myself to learn it. So in this line of business, it's all about learning, learning. You don't stop it. You just have to learn till you get to a point where you feel uncomfortable not to learn. Okay. So uh, that's that's my advice. Again, this video is going to be ready by tomorrow. Uh, yesterday, I had to prepare C++ and uh, also work on this. And this one, uh, what we did yesterday was about two hours long. So it took almost half of my day rendering it. My PC is not that strong. And tomorrow, too, I'm supposed to record a C++ session. So um, this video may be ready in the course of the day, around 2 o'clock. So just bear with me. I'm the same person doing all the work, okay? Eventually, we will hide. So thank you very much for coming. Pai, thank you for another awesome session. Please, uh, those of you think I don't sleep, I sleep okay. <laughs> so stop contacting me around 1 o'clock. <laughs> All right, so see you tomorrow and uh, have fun coding. <laughs> Master, you don't sleep, you don't sleep. <laughs> this brings us to the end of our tutorials. Now, as I always say, please don't fall prey to shortcuts. 
learning programming requires you to spend time to obey the process spend time to understand the basics don't be in a rush if you go in rashly you will end up not knowing anything is that okay remember follow the process take your time to understand the language that you are using you are as good as how best you can use your tools now i want to express my gratitude to our partners and sponsors say take designs and build smart agricultural machinery suited for african conditions and use they also provide fabrication training and computer aided design services to manufacturing industries Seriatech Technologies is an electronic component retail shop at China House Adum Kumase. So you can contact them for all your electronic components, including Arduino kit and sensors of all kinds. Teskin Enterprise is the number one distributor of electronic components, electrical components, and hardware. You can locate them at HM4 Market Kumase. Call them for all your electronics and hardware needs from analog to digital devices. Electronics deal in smart electronic system development, software and web apps, IoT system design, project and research, and IT training. You can contact us for your next multi-million dollar project. If you want to be a sponsor or partner of this program, please call us on the numbers displayed on your screen and we'll be happy to sit down with you. You can also donate in cash or in kind to support our training. We actually need a good camera and sound system for our video recordings. And uh, I'm planning on starting an electronic session and I will need these tools for better uh, video recordings. Okay, Your support will be very appreciated. You can Momo us any amount using the Momo account on the screen, okay? From five cities to 500 billion Ghana cities or dollars, everything would be welcome. Now, remember, Ketwebien so help us make Africa tech literate. Once again, thanks for watching this tutorial. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to this channel. We want to know how we can make this training better for you. So let us hear from you by posting a comment in the comment box below. Alright, I am Professor and this is Tech Foundation.